Alright guys, welcome back to another uh, Tips for the Knife Makers with Walter Sorrells. Uh, just so you know, you know, kind of what we're going to be doing today, um, I'm going to be blabbing for a while and then I'll open things up for questions. Um, the game plan here is to run for about an hour uh, and the topic for the day is going to be protecting knife making ideas. So uh, I got a note from uh, one of my Patreon supporters who was concerned about the possibility of unintentionally uh, using some other knife maker's design. So, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of come at this from a couple of different directions and, uh, you know, talk about maybe patents and, uh, you know, intellectual property just kind of as a general thing. Um, I'm just kind of warming up here, by the way, as, as people are drifting in. Um, but, uh, you know, what, I, what I'm going to try and give people a sense of is, like, if you've designed a knife and you want to protect, you know, something about that design, or, on the other hand, if you, um, you know, are just kind of concerned, I think a lot of knife makers are, are sort of concerned that, like, there's so many designs out there, <clears throat> you know, am I going to steal somebody's design inadvertently, or, you know, what are the consequences if I do? So... Uh, that's kind of what I'm going to be chatting about. Um, hopefully going to go about 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm getting a note here that the volume's a little low, so let me crank it up a little bit more. Um, so, uh, so anyway, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try and, um, talk a little bit about some of the things that you might, uh, have to deal with in terms of intellectual property. Um, so, uh, all of this led to me uh, thinking that it's worth just going over some basics about what kind of knife, you know, what kinds of knife making ideas you can't legally protect and what you can, um, as well as, you know, how not to steal somebody else's ideas. So, uh, the basic thing that, <clears throat> that we're talking about here, like I said, is what lawyers call intellectual property or IP. Now, before I go any further, let me make this absolutely 100% clear. Not a lawyer, not given legal advice. This is just kind of my com commonsensical take on this issue based on, you know, 40 years of being a creator in intellectual property related businesses. Uh, so, let's start with this. What is somebody's idea in the context of knife making? You know, what does it even mean from a legal perspective? Well, that depends. In American law, you have a bunch of ways of protecting an idea. Patent, trademark, copyright, and there's also kind of a, a little bit mushier concept called the trade secret, and that would typically be something that's governed by a contract, like a non-disclosure agreement, you know, so that's protected uh, by an agreement between two parties rather than some overarching law. So let's kind of work our way toward the most important thing later, and I'll start with copyright. So that covers written expression as well as, you know, songs, artwork, stuff like that. Basically, if you can put it on paper, you can copyright it. Song lyrics, music, books, novels, articles, painting, software code even, I think, um, stuff like that. So, for instance, I can copyright a description or a pictorial depiction of a device, like a knife, but, and this is the key point, that doesn't protect the idea of the device itself, just that representation of it on paper. So, copyright doesn't really get you much when it comes to knives. Now, just another couple things here. Um, copyright, just if you're interested, it applies the minute you put pen to paper, the minute you type something in uh, on a computer, it's protected by copyright law. So that said, I believe this still holds true. Uh, it used to be certainly that you could go through a registration process. You send it in, I believe, to the copyright office, and this formalizes a protection that's already there by law. So uh, if you're... If you're um, doing a, a copyright registration, it just records it. If you've recorded it with the copyright office in the government, it's dated, you know, there's a record of it, and nobody can come back and say, dude, I wrote that 
saw them 10 years ago or whatever. But again, the protection in theory comes from the moment of creation. So what about trademarks? Um, you know, a trademark, basically that's like the IBM logo, the name Kleenex, uh, the Nike swoosh, you know, the name Joe's super duper red hot sauce, whatever. You can register a trade trademark and then prohibit other, other people, um, from referring to their, you know, their snot rags, or they can't call them Kleenex, or their pepper sauce, you can't call it Joe's. But the trademark doesn't, like, map to something related to the design per se, at least not as I understand it. So patents are really the most important legal protection for knife making designs, because there you're actually you know, protecting the idea of the device itself. So patent law is basically there to protect inventions, you know, what we just intuitively think of as inventions. So you're talking technology, devices, widgets, industrial processes. Unlike copyright, which applies from the moment of creation, a patent has to be applied for, and it's only going to be granted if it meets some standards. And those are novelty, you know, it can't be something that somebody else has already invented. It has to be non-obvious, quote unquote. Um, and in some cases, I believe it also can or has to have maybe uh, industrial applicability. I'm a little vague on that part of it. But anyway, um, the point I believe on, on the industrial applicability part of it is that, um, for instance, you can patent an industrial process that's distinct from the actual product per se. Um, so anyway, uh, a patent's pretty complicated and really quite expensive. So you have to describe the invention, document it, hire a lawyer, draw pictures, technical drawings, whatever, and then you submit all this stuff to the patent office. So you're probably looking at five grand on the low end, as I understand it, to, to make a, a patent happen. And, you know, you could spend five or ten times that. So, how does all this apply to knives? Uh, first point is, you know, you can't come out and say, here's this cutty thing with a handle and a blade, give me a patent. Right? Novelty. They've been making knives since the Stone Age, right? It's literally man's first tool, you know, other than like a stick. So, if you look through books about historical knives, you'll just see this amazing diversity of mechanical shapes, you know, gizmos, approaches, blade types, purposes, and so on. Uh, you know, it's just going back not just hundreds, but thousands of years. People have done all these different kinds of knives. So again, I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I'm aware, you can't patent a nifty shape or a cool, you know, what we intuitively think of as a design. So there's going to be a pretty high bar on knife design compared to, say, a golf ball washer or a piece of arcane um, semiconductor technology. Uh, I'm getting a note saying that my uh, ta my uh, oh yeah, not running off the voice mic. This is odd. Well, give me a second here. Let me uh, let me try and uh, solve this technical problem, and I will be back in a flash. All right, so um, let me see if this is giving me decent uh, sound here. Can anybody tell me if uh, if the sound is a little bit better? Um, 
I don't know why I'm having trouble with the sound. Uh, it should be coming through this mic, but it is possible that I'm going through the internal mic on the uh, camera. Hopefully that's not the case. Uh, if, I, if I can't solve it here, then I'm just going to forge ahead and maybe I'm going to sound like I'm in a tin can. <laughs> but if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. Um, all right. So I'm just going to forge ahead here. <clears throat> um, so getting back to the patent issue, uh, are there any knife related patents? Sure. Um, you know, what's typically patented in knife making are folding, knife lock, and deployment mechanisms. Uh, you know, kind of the more nerdy and complex it is, the more likely that you could patent it. Um, and maybe if you had a cool spin on replaceable blades, something like that. But shapes, designs, the kind of stuff that you look at it and you say, oh, that's pretty cool. That's the kind of stuff that's not so much likely to be patentable, at least as I understand it. So how might you fall foul of patent law? If you take a patented lock mechanism like Spider Coast compression lock or the axis lock, you know, something like that, you can't use that. Um, you know, if, if you're, um, if you're using a compression lock, um, something that somebody has actually patented, then that's something you're just prohibited from doing. Um, now patents only run a certain period of time. I believe it's typically 14 to 20 years and it kind of depends on the type of technology that you have, uh, that you copyrighted, I mean that you patented. And so in that case, um, once that patent expires, then you have no protection. Um, so, uh, you know, typical cases, like I say, would be um, locks and stuff like that. Um, but uh, in any case, um, here's to me kind of the issue um, for, for using it personally. Um, if you well let's let's just finish up with with the um you know how could you fall afoul of, of patent law if you you know if you take something that's been patented by somebody else and you use it obviously that's you know they can sue you they can get a cease and desist against you and they can force you to stop doing it on the other hand if you you know negotiate uh, an agreement with them and pay them you know, whatever royalty they ask for, then typically you're good to go. Um, the question is, you know, do you want to do that? Um, so flipping it over in the other direction, um, if you're a knife maker, do you want to patent your ideas? Um, and that's a question everybody, you know, everybody's got to look at their own situation and, you know, decide what they want. I mean, there's a really interesting case of uh, a guy, Michael Walker, um, who invented the, uh, the uh, liner lock. It's a very elegant, clean sort of design, um, but I wouldn't say it's like the best, you know, lock mechanism or anything, but um, it's a one-handed opening thing, which is, you know, for complicated reasons, something that, you know, a lot of knife makers are trying to do. And uh, he invented this back in, I want to say like 1981 or something like that. He did not patent it, but he trademarked the name Walker Liner Lock, I believe uh, he, he trademarked. So what this meant is that everybody could use that, that lock mechanism and they didn't have to pay him anything. And, you know, there was no requirement of doing anything other than if you refer to it as a liner lock, you know, you, you sort of wanted to, uh, you know, say that it was his design. Um, what this meant was that he was able to sort of use that as a calling card for, you know, forever. That was his future as a knife maker. Um, and uh, I'm getting one more note here.
All right. <clears throat> well, so anyway, we're still having trouble with the audio. It's not really going to be something that I'm going to be able to solve right now. Uh, I'm going to take a hard look at my whole setup. It, it all worked fabulously uh, last time, and for some reason, it is not working worth a hoot this time. So I'm just going to do my best and forge ahead here. Um, in any case, um, getting back to, to Michael Walker, um, you know, basically he was able to use the fact that all these people had adopted this lock and it became kind of a standard lock because basically nobody had any, uh, nobody had to pay him royalties, nobody had to get his approval, therefore all, you know, it became a very, very popular thing to use. And his reputation became huge as a result of that, you know, spreading all over the place. Whereas if he patented it and, you know, had people um, pay royalties for it, I don't know, maybe it would have never, you know, become as famous a thing as, as it uh, ended up being. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you sort of have to weigh in, you know, deciding whether you want to patent something or not. Um, in uh, you know in the knife world you you're probably not going to sell zillions and zillions of units or something you spend five thousand or ten thousand or maybe even more you know patenting wh whatever it might be uh, and it's sort of hard to see how you know from a dollars and cents standpoint a an individual guy can really justify that um, so, uh, so I, you know, that's just kind of my personal thing. I'm not trying to dissuade anybody from patenting anything, but uh, just that's sort of the equation that I think most people would want to go through in order to figure out, you know, is this, uh, does this, does it make sense to go through this? Um, so. Uh, let me, uh, let me kind of wrap up, up this whole thing, put a little bow on it here. You know, basically, I think a lot of people worry, and, you know, the, the, the guy, um, who originally sort of hit me up with this question was concerned that he might be, you know, treading on other people's designs. As a general rule, I don't think you should be too, too concerned about that. Um, there's... It's not that there's nothing new in, in the world of knife making, but realistically, you know, they're just, um, there are a lot of little tiny similarities between designs, and there are a lot of things that, you know, two or three people might solve the exact same problem in the exact same way. And so, you know, as an ethical thing, you don't want to go out there and just copy somebody's idea without attribution or, or, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I wouldn't, you know, be so scared to do anything, um, you know, because, oh God, I might be, you know, infringing on somebody's idea. That really most knife wit makers shouldn't worry too much about. All right. Well, uh, I am going to wrap that up here and, uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw it open uh, for uh, for questions, um, but uh, you know I, the the whole issue of, of intellectual property and knife making is kind of interesting because you know it's it's not like oh uh, you know software design or you know designing uh, semiconductors or something like that. If you um, if you if you make a new semiconductor, it's pretty obvious that you're, you know, that you're moving things forward. Whereas with knives, we've got this just enormous history that's, you know, literally thousands of years old, where all these different people have been solving uh, similar kinds of questions. Um, and, you know, they may do it in slightly different ways, but, you know, really, they're just, they're a, a lot of times different people are going to be solving that uh, questions, you know, in, in similar kind of ways. Uh, all right. So let me see if we've got some questions here to answer. Uh, all right. Well, uh, while, while I've uh, got a second to pause here, um, 
let me mention that uh, I do have a Patreon page. If you are digging this channel, uh, normally my audio quality is much better than this. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, you know, if you want to help out the channel, uh, we've got a link in the uh, description for my Patreon page. One of the cool things that I do for, uh, you know, Patreon supporters for the page is that every time I do a video about, you know, a particular build, whether it's some kind of um, uh, tool that I've developed, you know, that want to share with folks, or, uh, you know, just the design for a particular knife, I'll do, um, you know, plans for it. I'll put those plans on there with all the dimensions and everything. And any anybody who signs up to support us on Patreon, uh, whether it's, um, you know, the smallest amount or, you know, more, more, more dough, uh, it doesn't matter. Everybody's, everybody's got those plans available to them. Um, so, uh, one other little thing to mention is, uh, I've been working on a new knife design right here. This is uh, a new design. I haven't even got a name for it. Uh, actually, the uh, I would say the main designer for this uh, is a friend of mine named Peter Renwick, um, and uh, a friend of his who's a knife combatives guy. And they they came up with this design, really, um, you know, based on kind of their training, and they they wanted something that. Spits, that fit some real specific kind of um, criteria for them. Um, and, uh, you know, we thought it was a pretty cool idea and worth, worth sharing. So anyway, not too long from now, Tactics Armory should have a uh, version of this available. This is actually just a prototype. Um, I'm going to be doing, uh, you know, some slightly different handle designs and stuff like that but anyway here's here's the basic idea of the knife um you know the idea that they had for it was that it's it's basically kind of a self-defense type knife it's it's uh, sort of a cross draw type um and they wanted something that would really kind of squeeze your hand in there tightly and uh have a big hook on it so that um you know, have good good retention. Anyway, um, it's going to be a little while before these are available on TacticsArmory.com, but it should be uh, should be out there. You know, I don't know, maybe in a month, something like that. All right, uh, let me go take a look at some of my questions here and uh, see what we might talk about. I see some familiar names here, some guys who uh, have been in touch with me along the way. Um, <laughs> so, Prone Wolf here said, uh, you know, that he's drawn a lot of knives that he thought were completely unique, uh, only to find, you know, one really similar looking later on. I mean, that's, that's so true, and, and I really feel like, you know, one of the, you know, frustrating things about knife design is that um, you just always feel like, in the back of your mind, did I see that design somewhere else before? Um, it seems kind of familiar once you've actually worked on it yourself, and, you know, maybe it feels familiar because you've seen it before, or maybe it's just that kind of deja vu sort of phenomenon uh, that, uh, you know, you, you feel like you've seen it before, but you haven't. <clears throat> um, all right, let me see if we got some more questions here. So, uh, question... Um, can I post a link to uh, what I just mentioned? Yeah, if you if you check the um, descriptions, it's got uh, my Tactics Armory uh, page, also um, WalterSorrelsBlades.com. 
Uh, for those of you who haven't been following me for a million years, uh, basically I have two websites. One that is, you know, focuses on my um, modern type knives, and then the other is all uh, the Japanese sword stuff. I originally started out doing Japanese swords, and um, then, uh, you know, about, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, um, I decided to start making some modern knives, and that kind of evolved into Tactics Armory. So, uh, anyway, tacticsarmory.com, you'll find all my modern kind of stuff, and then waltersorrelsblades.com, that's all my Japanese sword stuff. And I continue to kind of juggle those two things. All right, let's get to some questions here. So, uh, how about quench plates versus oil and water? Um, so, for those of you who aren't aware of what quench plates are, um, you know, the oldest way of heat treating a knife was to heat the thing up in a fire, kind of till it was sort of cherry red, stick it in a bucket of water, and it hardened. Over time, uh, steels developed that, um, you know, steels were developed that could be um, quenched in oil, and over more time, uh, steels were developed that could um, be quenched in air, meaning basically you just heat them up, you take them out, you let them sit there in still air, and as they cool down, they'll harden. So, um, one of the big problems that happens with all quenching is that stuff warps. This is not necessarily a flaw in technique or whatever, depending on what kind of quench you're doing. Um, you know, like if you quench in water, it tends to uh, warp towards the spine. If you do in oil, it tends to uh, warp towards the uh, cutting edge. Um, but you'll also get side to side warps, and those are the ones that are really nasty and, you know, harder to deal with. So, what, um, what plate quenching is, and this only works for um, air hardening steels, which is basically, you know, the, the basically the category of stainless steel. Um, you can basically take them out of the fire, out of the, you know, forge or whatever, stick them into uh, between a couple of heavy plates, usually aluminum, but you could theoretically do it with steel or whatever, and you just squash it. And typically you'll blow compressed air on it or whatever to cool it down a little bit faster, but those plates will soak up heat and that will effectively quench the, um, the knife. So why would you do that? As I said, uh, the main reason for plate quenching is um, to keep the, the blades from, you know, warping like this. Um, so I, I quite... Uh, a plate quench all of my um, uh, stainless steel knives because uh, it keeps them from um, from uh, warping and you know as long as you hit them up with some compressed air uh, and get them to cool down quickly enough uh, they'll be nice and hard and um, you know so uh, personally stainless steel I always quit uh, plate quench all right, let's see. Have I ever made Damascus? This is from Zach Reimer. Uh, have, or maybe that's Reimer, I don't know. Um, have you ever made Damascus using Crew Forge 5? I have not. I have no experience with it whatsoever. Uh, most of the Damascus that I do is with um, either good old... Um, you know, 1095 or 10, 1080, something like that, and 15 and 20, for those of you who uh, are new to this, 15 and 20 is a nickel, uh, nickel steel. You get a real strong contrast with that. That's a pretty typical, you know, combination. Uh, also, for my Japanese things, I'll use 1050 and 1095, but sorry, I have no experience with crew wear. All right, Rick Suttles. For a small time knife maker, is it worth time? Is it worth the time to do a name or logo? 
I, you know, I really don't have any super strong um, thoughts on that. I, I mean, I would say, yeah, just as a general rule. The, you know, the main question is if you want to sell them, I, I would say. If you want to sell them personally, I would uh, put some kind of mark on them. Um, but, you know, I've sold knives that I, I didn't put anything on. So, uh, you know, to me, it's really sort of a word of mouth type thing. If you, if you sell one and it's got your name on it and somebody says, you know, to his buddy, hey, look, there's this cool knife and, you know, you can get one from this guy. So it, it's really a personal preference kind of thing. But the more commercial you get, the more I think it makes sense to, to put some kind of logo on them. All right, Stone in the Field says, 5160 question. Uh, I'm making a fro and I form the eye, bend it around. Uh, should I heat treat it or just leave it, worried about it being brittle? Um, yeah, sure, I would heat treat. You know, any kind of edge tool, uh, I personally would heat treat. Now, I know that there are people who make fros and, you know, some other things that are strictly for use around wood that um, that just use mild steel or something like that and they don't bother to heat treat them. Um, you know, 5160 is an oil hardening steel. Um, if you oil harden, just, you know, just heat the, the blade part of it, oil harden that, uh, and then temper it at, you know, 450 or something like that, you're going to have something that's nice and hard, plenty hard, for, uh, for use in wood, but it's not going to be brittle. 5160 is a very robust, tough kind of steel anyway. So you should be, you know, as long as you do everything right, you should be in pretty good shape with that. Dread the Mad Smith. I recently switched to peanut oil and missing out on not having an industrial quench oil, uh, or am I missing out on having an industrial quench oil, or is it not that big a difference. Uh, you know, I, I would say it, it kind of depends on what steel you're using. Um, I went to Parks 50, you know, a long time ago, uh, which has some, some advantages that um, peanut oil doesn't have. But, um, you know, for kind of the average guy, hobbyist, uh, maker, you know, I don't, I don't really see that you lose a ton that way. Um, the, the biggest, you know, question is those kind of, um, borderline type steels. Uh, if you have something that is a water hardening or, you know, borderline water hardening steel, 1095 is a good example of that. Um, then, um, a fast quenching oil like Parks 50 is really useful. But, you know, all quench oils are kind of specific. So, in a sense, they're made for tuning a particular, um, you know, type of steel in a particular kind of circumstance. If you're doing a whole bunch of different things and peanut oil is working for you, you know, I, I don't think you know, the, the average hobbyist kind of guy needs to run out and, you know, buy 50 gallons of, of Parks 50. I'm sure that there will be people who will disagree with me on that. <laughs> and, you know, I, I guess, you know, the, the philosophical issue that that, that, that raises, the, you know, the thing that kind of looms behind that is, um, how would I say this? you know, how perfectionist do you want to get? You know, the, there's always this sort of Excalibur, you know, thought that's in the back of people's mind when they're making knives, you know, how can I make the most, most, most perfect thing? If you want to do the most, most, most perfect thing, then uh, it's worth your while to find a an oil that's, you know, synced up with the type of steel that you want to um, heat treat. But if you're, like I said, if you're doing a bunch of different kinds of things um, and, you know, you're not trying to get the last, you know, 1% of uh, performance out of the knife, peanut oil is great. You know, it's cheap, it's uh, eco-friendly, and, uh, you know, it, it's got a reasonably high flash point. So 
you know, I, I like I like peanut oil actually. All right, Ray Bond um, made my first fixed blade, uh, first forged blade, Japanese Tonto from 1080-ish steel. First quench didn't harden. Part of it I normalized, and will water oil quench tonight. Uh, are the odds higher of cracking now? I assume that what you're getting at is if you quench something twice, is it more likely to quench that, I mean, to crack that second time around? Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, I've had quite a few knives that I've quenched several times for various reasons, and I haven't noticed, uh, you know, a particular problem, but it may well be one of those too small sample size to really say. I've heard people call it both ways, so... I'm going to plead ignorance on this and say, hey, go for it. You know, <laughs> again, sort of backing up to the, you know, philosophical question behind the uh, the case here. Um, you know, it, do you... Uh, how, how, how worried do you want to be about failure? And my, my feeling is always... A failure is also a learning experience. So I always say, if I'm in doubt, just go ahead and do it. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Hey, you know, I learned something. Uh, along those lines, also about, um, you know, quenching in water and oil. I, I mean, if you don't stay in the water too long and you have hot oil to go into, and for those of you who, you know, haven't been following me for too long or, you know, in too, too much depth... My standard heat treat with Japanese swords is to quench in water for like four seconds, give or take, uh, and then to transfer it to um, hot oil, like 300 degree oil. Um, and it, you know, it's amazing how just overnight that ended all my cracking problems. I started doing that almost 20 years ago and I've never gone back. And it, and it really, it gives you, especially if you're doing hormones or something, it gives you really nice hormones. And, and uh, it, it, to me, it's, it's a good kind of compromise way of, uh, of heat treating uh, water hardening um, uh, steels. All right. <clears throat> Uh, how did I get into knife making? Clayton, I'm going to get back to you on this. Let me, let me answer this question and then I will go into the whole, um, how I got into the knife making thing. Uh, from Jeremy, uh, Ball Ball, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, thanks for the inspiration and knowledge to get me going. Finish my first knife a lot because of your videos. Well, thanks, man. That's, that's really... Uh, that's always gratifying to hear that and congratulations to you that first knife is always it's such a big thing and you know I, I, I still have the first knife that I made <coughs> super ugly horrible probably everybody who's made a knife on this channel uh, you know that's watching me right now their first knife was better than mine um, you know it, it's 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 such an exciting thing to make that first knife and to realize like hey this is something I can actually do um, so, again, congratulations to you. All right, um, Clayton Burris asked, uh, how did I get into knife making? How old was I? So, I am 58 years old right now, and I got started um, going on 25 years ago now. Not quite that much. But anyway, uh, this, this is kind of a, a long-winded story. Um, I started my career as a novelist. So, I've written, I want to say... It, it's, it's, it's a little unclear how many books I've written, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 35. Um, and I say it's unclear. I mean, there, there surely is an exact number. I don't know exactly what it is. But um, the, uh, the, the deal with that is that, you know, I have ghost-written books and, uh, you know, novelized TV shows and done all this crazy stuff. And so... Um, it, uh, it's hard even to say exactly which books I've written and which I didn't. Um, anyway, uh, so about, you know, 20 odd years ago, I had this idea that I was going to write a, uh, book with a, a hero who was, or, you know, main character who was going to be a, um, uh, sword maker, swordsmith. Now, I've been doing martial arts for a long time at that point. I've always had a long, you know, long-standing interest in Japanese culture and Japanese, uh, weaponry and you know I've lived in Japan for a while anyway 
um, I thought, well, let me just, you know, kind of do something with that's tactile, something with my hands that'll give me a hook into what this character has to do. I wasn't setting out to make swords or anything. I just, you know, I just wanted to get some feel for what this guy was going to be doing. So, um, the first thing I actually did is I took a burn somatic little propane, you know, like plumbing torch and this tiny piece of steel. It was literally this big. I don't think it was even, you know, it was like mild steel. And I heated it up with that, dunk, you know, dinky little torch and it was just barely red. And then I took this little ball peen hammer and I just started bashing it on a rock. So I was using a rock as an anvil. And I was like, oh man, this is awesome. <laughs> and, you know, that was, uh, that I just got the, I got the sickness at that point. And, um, you know, I sort of juggled writing and, um, and knife making for quite a few years and went full time as a knife maker. Um, going on a decade ago now, I guess, um, for various reasons. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's how I got started, uh, purely on a lark for a, for a book I was writing. All right. Uh, another question here. <clears throat> what kind of normalizing cycles do you use on your Damascus? Um, I use ADCRB2 and 15 and 20. Uh, I do normal, normalizing cycles of 1650, 1500, and 1350 with subcritical quench at 1350. Um, so I'm not, you know, I haven't used a ADCRB2 very often. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I, I don't normalize in my oven. I normalize... Um, you know, by eyeball, essentially. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of what <clears throat> normalizing is, um, it's a pre-heat treat, heat treating process. Anyway, it's, it's something like, it's, it's similar to annealing. Uh, what you're trying to do is, among other things, reduce stress and most importantly, reduce grain size. Um, and, you know, kind of the typical industry thing is to heat something up to about 1600 degrees. It can depend on the, on the steel, but 1600 is kind of the, the you know, bog standard uh, process. Heat it up to about 1600 degrees and then cool it and that will decrease the grain size of the steel, which has, you know, all kinds of positive implications for, um, you know, what happens after heat treating. Um, it's pretty typical for knife makers to go to, to triple normalize uh, carbon steels um, and, and, you know, things that are similar to carbon steels like, you know, 15 and 20. Um, so some, some people like to do something in the neighborhood of 1600 and then drop it down and then drop down to something um, below critical temperature and people have different formula, formulas. Honestly, the way I do it is I, you know, I hit critical, go up a good little bit to what I think is around 1600 degrees and then I'll just do that three times in a row but kind of drop in the temperature basically just based on experience and eyeball. So, you know, people who do it by really specific temperatures using, um, you know, using their, their uh, heat treating ovens are doing it, you know, fancier than I am, honestly. So I don't really have a um, educated opinion on that. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> uh, prone wolf, does grinding after actually help with warps and uh, pings? Uh, if so, is it offset by belt usage or not worth it? Starting out with uh, blah blah blah. Okay, so the, the general question is: Should you should you um, grind after heat treatment or before? There are a lot of complexities to this because you know you can you can sort of lock uh, stresses into steel. And when you start grinding it, the heat and the, you know, grinding off of different parts of the steel that may have differential, you know, uh, amounts of um, stress in them can cause warpage. That's the theory. 
I have never found that to be particularly uh, an issue, um, but I gather that some people disagree with me on that. So, you know, my personal opinion is it's a lot easier to grind before heat treat. So I grind before heat treat, do a, thin, a, a final, you know, very fine, by fine I just mean small grind just a little bit to get you know some decarb or whatever off of the skin of the of the steel and to Im increase the surface um, you know finish a little bit and that's basically it works for me but you know great minds can think of other ways of doing it so all right Ray Bond another Japanese sword question how do Western Smiths usually sign the Nikago uh, just use English characters stamped in, translate into Japanese characters, or something else. Um, you know, I kind of wrestled with this because, and this this raises, I, I, you know, I keep jumping into philosophical issues, but I think that's kind of one of the fun parts of doing these live streams is that, um, you know, I can kind of talk about some of the stuff that goes through my mind when I'm thinking about, you know, particular uh, aspects of knife making. And this is one that I actually thought about quite a bit. Um, there's a certain kind of person who's into Japanese swords who wants somehow to become Japanese. Um, you know, personally, I lived over in Japan. Japan's a really cool country. Wouldn't want to live there. Don't want to be Japanese. And so, you know, despite the fact that I really love Japanese swords and practice Japanese martial arts and all that, I wanted to put my name in Roman characters on the, um tang of the of the uh, sword for those of you who don't know that's the standard thing in japan is that you chisel uh, the characters of your your name or your <clears throat> sort of uh, people have a, a smith name that's not their their born name um and you chisel that into to the sword so i tried doing that several times and it looked like ass it was terrible and you know maybe that's my own lack of skill in carving or whatever but i just thought it really looked bad and so what i ultimately um decided to do was to just transliterate the name walter into you know Japan, Japanese has three different sets of characters they have chinese characters which are basically pictograms and then they have um, katakana and hiragana, which are phonetic, and so um, if so, what I did is I just tra you know transliterated Walter into Wateru, three characters in uh, you know of these phonetic characters, and so that's how I sign my blades. Um, there are other guys who have taken uh, you know some sort of Japanese name and they chisel that in but most of the guys that I know who make um, you know Westerners who make Japanese swords do chisel some kind of Japanese characters into the sword rather than Roman letters I don't know whether they came at that you know for this the same you know in, in the same theory that I did but that was that was my logic anyway I just thought it looked terrible when I did it, <laughs> you know, when I, when I tried to carve English, uh, you know, letters in using a tiny little chisel. Jay Frazier, thoughts on AUS 810, um, for an EDC knife. Um, I, you know, I haven't used... A US eight or uh, uh, you know it's just something I don't have experience with so um, you know here's here's my general take on types of steel is that a lot of people kind of overthink this stuff if you if you want to make something that's really hard to sharpen and it keeps a really good edge then some of these um, high vanadium uh, steels you know kind of super steel stainless steels um, are are good um, and there's some that are more shock resistant than others. You can get on the internet and look up the, you know, specs on these things. But honestly, just doing a decent job of the heat treat and doing a good job with the, um, you know, geometry of the knife is way more important to me anyway than what kind of steel you use. So I, I, this gets back to the, hey, give it a whirl and see what, you know, see how it works for you. But you know, those are 
long established deals that have been good for a lot of people so you know I, I would say go for it all right Jason do you have any tips or tricks for telling the color of heated Uh, do you have any tips or tricks for telling the color of heated steel for colorblind people? I have no idea what lemon yellow or cherry red looks like with hot steel. All I see is red or white. <clears throat> and a follow-up to that was um, uh, Grayson uh, Gillibranks, Banks, Gillibranks, Banks, hope I'm, I'm, I'm sure I just butchered your name. Anyway, uh, Grayson suggested uh, that Jason might use a magnet. Um, Jason says, when welding, it's hard to see when I'm up to temp. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, you know, the, the thing is, first off, I'm not colorblind, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of making this up, and this is probably going to be useless, but, you know, my general thought would be just look for the intensity of the color rather than the you know, um, whether it's red or yellow or whatever. Um, it's really important that your light is uh, repeatable, by which I mean that y you always want to work in the exact same lighting conditions, if at all humanly possible. Um, when, you're, when you're doing blacksmithing, um, at least where temperature is critical, because you know, every time you look at it, you're always judging what the temperature is based on the color. And while it is true that it does go from red to orange to yellow to white, it's also just getting brighter that whole time. And so I would think if you if you are in a place where, um, you know, where you've got consistent lighting, and, and, and in essence, you, what I mean is you want it to be pretty dark. Um, your, your, your eye will get better over time at, you know, figuring out how bright that steel is. Um, you know, if, if you do stuff outdoors, it's just almost impossible to gauge temperature based on, um, uh, lighting conditions. Um, so, you know, in my case, I literally blacked out all the windows in my shop so that, you know, if I want to get to zero light, I can. Um, but, you know, any time that I'm doing uh, quenching, I always replicate the lighting situation. You know, I basically have one light that I turn on, I turn, I turn everything else off. And that way I kind of have a reference standard, you know, so every time I do it, it always looks the same. Um, and I guess that's about, you know, the best I can give you on that. Um, Jason's point about, I think it was Jason, uh, no, sorry, um, well, anyway, yeah, Gray, yeah, Grayson was, was talking about using a magnet. So, to me, this is, you know, my process, I always heat things up, I've tested with the magnet, and so I know when I've hit that 1425 point, um, and then I can work off of that visually, um, you know. So in, in essence, I'm controlling two things. I'm controlling, uh, you know, I'm using the magnet to, you know, to set, okay, I've reached that particular temperature, 1425. Uh, and then, you know, I'm gauging past that based on experience, really. All right, we are running up close to an hour here. Um, <laughs> that's a good question here. Um, so I believe this is Colby. My wife's writing all these uh, on cards and handing them to me so I don't have to spend too much time looking down at the computer here. Um, so I'm having trouble reading her handwriting, but I think this is Colby. Um, asks, uh, do you have tips for sealing handles? Um, new to the knife making family and, uh, and my, new to knife making and my family lets them soak in water when they're done using them. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> I wish there was an easy answer to this. Um, you know, here, here, here are a few, a few thoughts. First is, if you use something synthetic, um, micarta or something like that, then you kind of get around the issue. If, if you know that you're making a kitchen knife, you're giving it to, you know, mom, and mom's going to throw it in the dishwasher every time, you just know that. Um, then something like micarta, you know, a, a, a industrial material is a good possibility. Um, another possibility is stabilized wood. Um, I, early on in my knife making career, made several um, knives with, um, with stabilized wood handles. For those of you who don't know about stabilized wood, basically you immerse a uh, block of wood in this resin material put a lot of pressure on it, soaks into the wood, and basically you get a plastic-like piece of wood. You know, it fills up all the little voids with plastic, in essence. Um, and, you know, so, so my little test was to use stabilized wood and just make it for kitchen knives and throw them in the, uh, in the uh, washing machine, you know, the, the dishwasher, and just, like, see, you know, see how they held up. Well, honestly, they didn't hold up that great. So the bottom line is, if you know that people who you're making this for are not going to take super good care of them, then, you know, make, you, use materials that are going to be, uh, that are going to work in that situation. If you use natural materials and they get really wet and people leave them in, you know, in the dishwasher or sink them down in a, a, you know, in the sink and leave them there for an hour, they're just going to get messed up over time. So, it just kind of is what it is. Uh, all right, getting some bad mic static I have heard. I don't know what that's all about. All right, well, uh, you know, I've had a bunch of, um, uh, technical issues here today. I'm trying to, like I said, this is only the second time that I've done this and uh, I'm doing my best to surmount these these hurdles. Um, real time, sometimes it's uh, difficult to fix them. Hopefully next time I'll have it all locked up and uh, won't have any problems with that. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here now. Um, thanks for sticking with me. I know uh, we had some problems with the sound here and um, it's, uh, it's great having you guys in, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to start doing these uh, live streams a little bit more often. Uh, thanks for uh, sticking with me here, and we'll see you again soon. Take care.